This is Origin Stories, the Leaky Foundation podcast. I'm Meredith Johnson. Humans have a big impact on ecosystems. A lot of the time, that impact is destructive. But sometimes, the worst kinds of human behavior can create an unexpected benefit for other animals and plants. There are places in the world, like the demilitarized zone between North and South Korea, for example, where nature is flourishing because people can no longer go there. The demilitarized zone is a strip of land that's about two and a half miles wide and 155 miles long. It was farmland for millennia before it became a deadly battlefield, and in the decades since the armistice treaties, forests and prairies have grown back and animals and migratory birds are thriving. It's gradually become an unofficial nature reserve, and scientists say that over 1,100 species now make their home in the demilitarized zone. The exclusion zone around the site of the Chernobyl nuclear disaster is another example. On today's episode, we're going to another one of these accidental nature reserves. Coiba National Park is made up of around 40 islands off the Pacific coast of Panama, and most of the island's forests are completely untouched by humans. The surrounding waters, which are also part of the park, provide habitat to whales, sharks, sea turtles, and all kinds of fish. Some birds that have disappeared from the mainland flourish on the islands of Coiba National Park, and there are mammals there that are recognized as entirely unique species found nowhere else in the world. Scientists love places like Coiba. It's a perfect natural laboratory where they can study animals and observe animal behavior in a healthy ecosystem, undisturbed by human activity. Producer and scientist Kevin McLean traveled to Coiba as part of a team to investigate some very unusual monkey behavior. We're at the end of a long, dry season in Panama's Coiba National Park. It's March of 2019, and leaves crunch under our feet as we walk through dry stream beds. The sun is intense. We found skeletons of snakes and monkeys resting on the ground, totally intact. Not killed and torn apart by predators, they just died. And I get it. This place is rough. If you look on a map, it doesn't seem like these islands are all that far from the mainland, but it feels so much more remote than it looks. No phone, no internet, any communication we do is with GPS units, which mostly work, I guess. And unlike the rest of Panama, almost all of the forests are completely intact, preserved almost by accident. I just knew that Cuba was a place for dangerous people <laughs> and that uh, the military guys will keep some of their political enemies here. That's Claudio Montesa. We work together in the same research group at UC Davis. He actually grew up in one of Panama's coastal provinces nearby, but as a kid didn't know a lot about this place. There is no real uh, a proper narrated story uh, that we get in high school or something. So it's just whatever you get from other people. For nearly a century, the main islands in what is now Coiba National Park were used as a prison colony. Around 3,000 people were incarcerated on these islands over the years. Uh, but when I grew up, it was becoming a national park and the prison started to shut down, like, slowly. People were imprisoned on the island up until 2004. But the prison camps themselves were fairly contained. And it's largely because of the prison that the whole archipelago was pretty much left alone. No logging, no island resorts. Meanwhile, more than half of Panama's forests on the mainland were decimated. Now researchers are drawn to the pristine forests on the islands. The park is home to some species that have disappeared from the mainland, like the scarlet macaw and crested eagle. Others like the Koiba Naguti and Koiba Island white-tailed deer are recognized as totally different species than their mainland counterparts. We hack away at the thorny vines and hanging vegetation. Or actually, I just let Claudio do that. We've known each other for years, so he knows better than to trust me with a machete. 
but we both use a lot of motion-activated cameras, or camera traps, in our research. So I tagged along to help set them up. A few years ago, Claudio had heard from other scientists that some of the capuchin monkeys here were a bit different than the ones on the mainland. Capuchin monkeys are about the size of a house cat, and there's a bunch of species throughout Central and South America. They're used pretty frequently in films and television, so there's a good chance that when you think of a monkey, you're thinking of a capuchin. Anyway, there were signs of some weird behavior from these capuchins in Coiba. Um... Well, it's very abstract, but it's basically a stone on top of another stone. <laughs> and that probably have nothing, not meaning. But when you think about the way things are in this river, stones are hardly on top of each other. A stone on top of another stone. Like those little rock stacks that hikers leave behind. Something left there to be noticed later. And in few occasions, some of them were surrounded by um, snail pieces. So it looks like something was foraging there. Broken clam and snail shells and cracked husks of tropical almonds were all over the ground near the stacked stones. And capuchin monkeys, which normally spend most of their time in the trees, were often seen running around on the beach. So Claudio came out with some other researchers and set up a few camera traps to investigate. And in the videos he collected, the monkeys were definitely acting weird. When you watch through the videos, you can see them holding a small stone in one hand to smash open little clams. Sometimes they come waddling up on two legs with a big stone in both arms and drop it like an anvil. No one had seen monkeys anywhere in Central America do this before. Also, it was only the males that were doing it, as far as they could tell. This is really unique. It's the, it's the first time that this particular genus of Cebus monkeys has ever been seen to use stone tools in any way, shape, or form. That's Meg Crowfoot. She's the principal investigator for this whole project. She's a Leaky Foundation grantee and capuchin monkey specialist. She explained that there are two subfamilies of capuchin monkeys— Robust capuchins are found in South America, and true to their name, they're more robust than the gracile capuchins we see here in Panama. Stone tool use has been recorded in robust capuchins, but no one had ever seen gracile capuchins doing this. And it's not for lack of trying. There's primatologists all over Central America whose job it is to wake up before dawn, go find capuchins, and follow them around all day. They're pretty well studied, so if it had happened somewhere on the mainland, someone probably would have seen it by now. Stone tool use is actually one of the ways that robust and gracile capuchins are typically distinguished from one another. Robust capuchins are one of only three primate genera known to use stone tools, and the other two are long-tailed macaques and chimpanzees. So adding gracile capuchins to the list is a pretty big deal. As we scramble up the bank into the forest, no one's thrilled to see us. The howler monkey screams at us, the capuchin monkeys we came here for bark, shake branches, and show their teeth. This might seem bold considering their size, but for capuchins it's pretty standard. Rude, but standard. What really struck me as bold was on another day when a capuchin wandered right down the trail, hardly paying any attention to us. These monkeys have had free reign of this archipelago for thousands of years. With no predators like pumas or ocelots to hunt them on the ground, they spend a lot of time on the forest floor. When we arrived in the park on this trip, the team had only confirmed that monkeys were using stone tools on one island, but there are dozens of islands in the park. While setting up traps on one of these other islands, Claudio noticed some familiar signs. First I saw it was like, oh, a stone on top of each other. Cool, fine. And then I saw another one, and I was like, wow, okay. Third one, I was like, okay, this is weird. And then I saw another one and another one, and they were just all around the, the river. There was like, this is not chance. This is very like, uh, it's a pattern. But you could see that at least it looks like different foraging spots. Stones on top of stones broken shells, 
It seemed as though monkeys on another island were also using stone tools. We set up cameras all around the area to confirm. The rest of the team arrives the next day, and when Claudio relays the news to them, he totally sells me out. Um, once we were there, Kevin tried shooting the, the line on the tree for like 20 times, and it didn't work. I mean, it will cross the, the, the line, but it will get stuck on woody vines or any vegetation that is on the tree. I should clarify, the cameras I came here to set up were meant for the canopy of the forest here in Coiba. Climbing trees and setting up cameras is an admittedly niche skill that I cultivated in grad school. But then he realized that he forgot the, the things to put the cameras on the camera, on, on the canopy. So we couldn't, he couldn't climb or there was no point of climbing that day. <laughs> so we have to go back the next day. <laughs> We'd taken a long boat ride to get to this particular spot. So I had wasted basically an entire day. Claudio was not pleased. I mean, neither was I. I guess he didn't so much sell me out as say exactly what happened. But in my defense, the day we went back is the day Claudio found the second stone tool site. So I feel like we can just call it even. Stone tool use is the kind of thing that piques the interest of primatologists, behavioral ecologists, anthropologists, and archaeologists. We've got all of those, and everyone is interested in answering different kinds of questions, especially now that we know it's happening on another island. We've had a few long days out in the forest, and we're all huddled around our non-campfire. With all the dry vegetation around, we're basically sitting in the middle of a tinderbox. So we've got a headlamp shining into a water jug. The light and the remains of our dinner attract some unwelcome attention. Get it off of me! No, no, they're not cute. They're the worst. These Halloween crabs that bury themselves in the sand during the day happily crawl all over us to snag bits of PB&J, spam scramble, tuna and mayo pasta, or whatever else was on the menu. Also, none of this stuff was refrigerated, and it definitely should be, right? (laughs) After dinner, uh, we debrief on the day's uh, work, talk strategy, and discuss theories. This new site adds a bit of excitement, and when there was just one island of weird monkeys, they could have been an anomaly. We could have just happened upon them at the right place at the right time, but monkeys on different islands that have been separated for thousands of years, all using tools in the same way. That seemed like more than chance. All the leaves were dropping the trees and just the habitat was entirely different than previous years was something that I'll think about. Brendan Barrett is an evolutionary anthropologist and a Leakey Foundation grantee. He and Claudio were the first ones to confirm the original stone tool site. Brendan has spent a lot of time thinking about the theories that have been proposed for how stone tool use comes about in other species and why these monkeys started doing it. And he says, yes, this place is unique, yes, these monkeys are unusual, but everything considered, maybe it isn't all that weird. These capuchins, pretty much every single theory in human evolution that has been proposed for the evolution of complicated tool use and extractive foraging and stone tool use, these monkeys check off the box for us. Basically, all the conditions you see in cases where other primates have started using tools, we see here. So they're really terrestrial under decreased predation risk, and they're also under a lot of ecological stress. And that makes sense. It's easier to use tools on the ground, so spending a lot of time down there makes it more likely to learn. Without predators around, they're free to bang around on the ground as much as they want without fear of getting eaten. And if you're on an island with limited resources, you're going to look anywhere you can to survive. Tamara Dogonzic is an archaeologist. She studies stone tool use in early humans. She's seen the remains of prehistoric tool use sites all over the world. Um, In Europe, like in Serbia, where I come from, in France, in Africa, in Morocco, in Mongolia, in Kenya. So those have been the projects I've been involved in. Most of our team is thinking about where this tool use came from and where it could take a species. But... Tamar is thinking about what this stone tool-using behavior leaves behind. 
like humans are hominins who produce the things that I study have been long dead and gone. So whenever I want to study what they have been doing, there are a series of obstacles. Working here has been really fascinating because you can observe behavior and soon after you see the remains of that behavior. So it's very easy sort of to link those two things. For Tamara, it's a bit like being a paleontologist who goes to Jurassic Park. You're used to making hypotheses based on preserved remains, but then all of a sudden you can watch that process in real time and see exactly how behaviors you observe leave signs someone might find in the future. And some behaviors that leave no signs at all. It's a chance to watch an excavation site materialize to hopefully fill in some gaps in our understanding of the fossil record. The ways these monkeys use stone tools and the process they went through to learn how to do it might be pretty similar to how ancient hominins did the same thing. Tamara is guiding the team in documenting the stones and the tool use sites. We're looking at, um, at tools themselves and like their morphology to sort of understand which kind of tools they're using, how were they selecting them, where they were moving them around, whether they were like preferring to smash this food with this rock and that food with that rock. They also set up an experimental excavation site to track how quickly stones, shells, and other signs of tool use accumulate. We have data uh, on camera traps. Um, about how many, how many monkeys for how long have been cracking nuts um, and shells at that site. And then we see how much food remains uh, are accumulated between our visits, which is every three, four months. So we can translate that relationship um, correlation to other sites and see how, how long they have been used. By clearing out a site and monitoring with cameras as monkeys come back to use it, she can get a sense of how long it takes for debris to build up over time. That'll help the team figure out how long the monkeys have been using any other sites they find. Everyone on the team is setting up different equipment and experiments to answer the next set of questions, but one of the things we're all interested in knowing is how related the monkeys are to each other. So Claudio has been trying to collect DNA from the monkeys. We set some hair traps that are using some quail eggs, and we use them because these quail eggs are pretty similar to eggs that the monkeys might find in the forest from other birds. Each hair trap is basically a clear tube. One or two eggs rest at the bottom of the tube and the top is open. The whole thing gets strapped to a tree. And then on the top of the trap there is a double side uh, tape so that we hopefully will collect hair. The chemical makeup of the hair itself can be used to determine how much of their diet comes from fruits and nuts on land or clams and snails in the water. They can find out just how important some of these foods they've learned how to access are to their survival. If the hair stuck to the tape has the follicle attached, they can extract DNA to help them understand how long these populations have been separated from the mainland monkeys. Scans of the seafloor show that at some point the islands were all connected, but so far it's not clear exactly when they got cut off. DNA analysis will also help figure out if there's enough genetic diversity in these monkeys for them to get by. Looking at them, you can tell they're a little ragged and snaggletoothed, but without genetics it's hard to know whether that's inbreeding or just a rough life. The cameras, the hair traps, the excavation experiment, these are all long-term studies that'll take months or years to yield results. As our team packs up camp, the plan is to return about every hundred days to collect data, change out cameras, and set more traps. Claudia and I made it back a couple months later to pick up the cameras we set up. From those, we were able to confirm that the monkeys were indeed using stone tools at that second site. Also, unlike the first site, it's only females that use this one. Claudio goes back one more time before the holidays at the end of 2019. And then COVID hits. The research site, the country, the whole world shuts down. It's been a little over two years since that first trip to Koiba, 
and obviously a lot has changed. Visits every hundred days haven't been an option. Most of the cameras are still out there, but probably ran out of batteries a few months ago at least. I've moved away from research, but everyone else is still involved in the project. They've managed to get some of the DNA samples they collected to labs for analysis, but the results haven't come in yet. There's definitely a lot that can be done remotely. Data analysis, reviewing literature, writing, applying for funding. But at some point, you really have to see the thing you're studying. They still don't know when anyone on the team will get a chance to go back. But whenever they do make it, I'm pretty sure the monkeys they've been longing to see this whole time still won't be happy to see them. Thanks to Kevin McLean for this story. You can learn more about the tool using monkeys of Koiba and see some videos. I've included links in the show notes. We've been getting some really great questions for our audience question episode. Please keep them coming. Ask anything you want to know about human evolution, and we'll find someone to answer your question. We'd also love some questions from kids. So leave a voice message at speakpipe.com slash origin stories, or call our voicemail line at 707-788-8582. Origin Stories is a project of the Leakey Foundation, a nonprofit dedicated to funding human origins research and sharing discoveries. You can support this show and the science we talk about by making a donation to the Leakey Foundation today. All donations towards the podcast will be quadruple matched, and we're trying to raise $1,500 by the end of August to meet a quadruple matching challenge from Jeannie Newman and the Anne and Gordon Getty Foundation. Every dollar you give to support the show will be multiplied times four. Visit leakyfoundation.org slash donate and leave a note in the notes section to let us know your donation is for the podcast. This episode was written, reported, and produced by Kevin McLean. Our editor is Audrey Quinn. Theme music by Henry Nagel. Closing music by Lee Rosevere. Thanks for listening. <laughs> <laughs>